There is a school of thought that says everything we do is ultimately futile because one day the Earth will end and take with it all of our accomplishments, that at best we might transplant ourselves elsewhere, yet the world will still end. But what if it didn't have to? So today we return to the Civilizations at the End of Time series with a bit of a different episode than I'd originally been planning. I'd initially meant to discuss how you'd survive around white dwarfs or neutron stars, dying stars, and we will get to that another time, but I thought for today we'd just see how long we could keep life on Earth going. A little over a year ago we took a look at the Fermi Paradox from the perspective of civilizations that just stayed at home rather than colonizing other solar systems. This is a topic we discuss a lot, and a couple months back we discussed how to evacuate Earth in the event of a catastrophe, and both got me thinking that even if folks leave Earth, there's always going to be folks that stick around. We tend to neglect those folks in science fiction a lot and in futurism too. I believe our destiny is out in the stars, or at least the interesting and hopeful parts are. When we see Earth in distant future stories, it's usually in the subgenre of fiction known as Dying Earth for the 1950 novel of the same name by Jack Vance. That book spawned a series written by him and inspired quite a few other works by other authors, probably the best known of those being Gene Wolfe's Book of the New Sun. Dying Earth novels tend to be dark fantasy in tone, usually set after some apocalypse and being fantasy in that they tend to feature low technology and magic that is usually leftover technology. That itself is fairly common in fantasy, a low-tech Earth after a cataclysm, Terry Brooks' Shannara series being an example. Dying Earth differs in that usually the civilization isn't a surviving remnant that's trying to rebuild, but one of constant further decay. The planet and humanity are exhausted. Earth is dying, body and soul, because folks have essentially turned to an existence of cannibalism and grave robbing, sometimes metaphorical, sometimes literal. If you're a regular to the channel, you can probably guess that such a future particularly nags at me, so I thought we'd challenge the notion of this being some bleak existence, as we had in other episodes. We looked at the time after all the stars had burnt out and showed that instead of civilization being gone, or nearly so, it might be the beginning of a far greater and longer period of civilization. If you're not a channel regular, which is probable since this series tends to be one most new viewers arrive at for some reason, then let me suggest you get a drink and a snack, as we don't go for brevity here, and switch on the closed captions, as the way I speak can take some getting used to. That's a handy reminder too, since while I try to make most episodes standalone, this series relies heavily on concepts we've detailed elsewhere and my speech impediment is more pronounced in older episodes. We'll put clickable links in the description below and some in video as we go along in case you want to learn more or need a refresher on some of the concepts covered in older episodes. One of the big aspects for this discussion, and the one that got me thinking, was the mindset of those who would stick around Earth if we were off colonizing other planets and building various megastructures, and this ties into those megastructures too. We often talk about how, with sufficient automation, it makes far more sense to build places to live like artificial habitats, as opposed to terraforming planets. It not only allows you to produce far more total living area, it also lets you tailor the environment much closer to Earth's, and quite probably is actually easier than terraforming a planet too. This inevitably leads to the notion that advanced civilizations do not regard planets as new places to live, but more like the local lumberyard. You don't live there, you visit it to pick up materials to build where you want to live. When gazing up at distant and barren alien planets, you just as inevitably tilt your eyes down to look at ours, and ask if we might disassemble it for our materials too. There's a lot of argument over whether we would or wouldn't preserve our homeworld, but usually it is in the context of building Dyson Swarms and Earth being a very large chunk of available building material. 
If you added up every other rocky planet, Mercury, Venus, and Mars, they would mass about as much as Earth combined. But if you added up every other rocky mass, every moon and asteroid, you would not have nearly as much mass as Earth. At the same time, you can build thousands of times the living area out of a planet as its natural surface permits, so if you are low on raw material and want to use Earth, you could easily offer every person living there hundreds of times more land than they already had as compensation and barely make a dent into everything you built out of that planet. That tends to be the usual argument, folks pointing out Earth is a huge chunk of available material from which we could make far more worlds in the future, and others saying we should preserve Earth regardless. We typically circumvent that argument here at SFIA by pointing out that while Earth is nearly half the available mass budget of rocky planets, moons, and asteroids, it is far smaller than our various gas giants, which have many planets worth of metals under all that hydrogen and helium, which we can access. Moreover, 99.8% of the mass of this solar system is in the Sun, and it contains tens of thousands of Earth's worth of metals that you can access via star lifting technology. As a reminder, in astronomy a metal is anything heavier than helium, so it would include elements like carbon, not just iron or titanium, with super strong allotopes such as graphene, which will likely be what we use to build with, more than steel anyway. We discussed how to retrieve all those materials from gas giants and the Sun, and it really doesn't require any truly impressive technology. More tech helps of course, but we've got the basic tools already. Earth used to have a big layer of hydrogen and helium over it too, but it was blown away by the solar wind. You can use the same technique, scaled up, to remove it from gas giants for instance, leaving a metallic core. The harvesting technique for stars actually involves ramping up that solar wind, in a focused and directional manner. These are staggering feats of engineering that dwarf anything we've ever done before. These tasks require a virtually unlimited supply of manpower working for thousands of years, but if you are building artificial worlds, you are already in that realm. If you need trillions of people to do the work, well you won't be doing it till you've already used up those asteroids and moons anyway, and will have those trillions of people to do it. And since you're building new living area, your timeline is only constrained by how fast your population grows. So we get a picture where Earth is not half of the materials available to build, but less than a percent of a percent. There are other ways and sources available too if that's not enough. I can easily see folks fighting constant battles, be it with wards, wealth, or weapons, to get access to Earth when it's half of your material, but not nearly as easily as when it's less than a percent of a percent. You might try to buy it, but outright coercion would seem less likely. With a supply of resources that big, it would be like someone disassembling the pyramids for road building material. Of course a lot of monuments have been taken apart to build roads and houses over the centuries, so one couldn't rule it out either, and we are talking about timelines of billions of years, not centuries. I've also been asked to focus more episodes down on Earth, perhaps a Downward Bound or Inward Bound series to complement the Upward Bound and Outward Bound series, where we talk about colonizing or mining other planets or stars, and it's tempting, but mostly it gets me thinking about who sticks around on Earth. Another thing we talk about a lot here is the notion of life extension, and the kind of impact that would have on a culture when dying of old age is a choice rather than part of a natural life cycle. You could start seeing folks living thousands of years, or even longer, and you'd expect them to have a disproportionate share of power, wealth, and influence. That could result in some terribly stable civilizations, and they might be a bit terrible in their own way too perhaps not a lot of upward mobility in a civilization where your boss just received an award for 500 years of service. So you expect a lot of younger folks, or those looking to have a lot of influence and impact, to migrate away from Earth. Once you max out a planet to its comfortable population, people wanting kids need to move, people wanting to climb ladders need to move, people bored with Earth need to move, people who want a bigger home and more land need to move, and so on while people bored with life presumably let themselves die and probably get replaced either by someone who really wants to live on Earth, complete with the culture on it, 
or got raised by folks who think a thousand years is a perfectly plausible timeline for an apprenticeship. Things don't necessarily have to go that way, but it's very easy for me to imagine Earth as a bit of an island of relics in a sprawling empire of a billion artificial habitats inside our solar system, itself inside an even more sprawling galactic civilization, old, rich, and quite possibly obsessive about preserving things. We try to keep our monuments and historic properties around these days, even though we didn't live there and experience that. It's possible they might not value antiques as much because there's no mystique to them. Odds are the construction crew for Stonehenge might complain less about moving or replacing some of the monoliths than we would, but I think it more likely every house on Earth would start resembling a museum or archaeological site. A friend once asked me how long it would take before we'd fill up every inch of land on Earth with graveyards, on similar lines to when we'd run out of space for landfills. The answer to both is never, we lose about 50 million people a year and we've got room for about 50 trillion graves without stacking, which we often already do. A million year supply, and bodies don't last that long and neither do landfills. Even planet-wide cities, ecumenopolises, won't run out of room for graves unless they are preserving bodies in carbonite or something, and of course they can and must build vertically anyway. But keeping to modern death rates and grave sizes, notably being six foot deep, you would layer the planet with tombs in a million years, and we still have five billion or so left. If those were perfectly preserved, you'd layer the land with tombs ten kilometers or six miles deep. We certainly tend to build on top of ruins, it's pretty well accepted that whether you build a city on a coast, or a hill, or a river, after a while what you're mostly building that city on is itself, and all the leftover buildings and garbage of prior generations. And with ultra-strong materials and better technology, I could see a civilization just locking up someone's apartment when they died with them in it, to never be used again, just visited and maybe not even that. That's a little bit more plausible than it sounds like too. Ultra-strong materials, along with ultra-durable ones and self-repairing ones, are likely to be technologies we pursue vigorously and are probably on the table, and have to be taken into the context of ecumenopolises and arcologies. As we said in ecumenopolises, a planet-wide city is hardly a paved-over dystopia absent any trees. Indeed you could have vast nature preserves the size of Yosemite or Madagascar in there among all the layers. You are building up, and your real limitation is heat. You can be pumping energy from solar collectors or fusion plants to light vast vertical farms, but you still have to get rid of that heat, and that limitation bottlenecks you long before you'd run out of space from building up, even with modern materials. Any level you want to light and operate adds to that heat whereas sealed off dark tombs do not, quite to the contrary, dark and cold help preserve them. I would also guess that a lot of people would feel a bit weird living in a house or apartment someone else had occupied for centuries. As I recall, back in various episodes on life extension and immortality we noted that if suicide was the main way folks died in the future, as accidents, disease, and old age diminish, We'd said keeping to mostly modern rates you'd expect a median lifetime of about 5,000 years, and our upper end on Ecumenopolises tended to be about 5 trillion inhabitants. Both of those numbers are very flexible, but it would mean a billion folks died a year, 20 times the current rate, even with ridiculously long lives. And if you were sealing people up like pharaohs with a lot of their stuff, you could layer yourself up pretty deep that way, potentially thousands of kilometers deep because the active support technologies we've discussed allow that sort of thing, and you can also stagger layers so that gravity doesn't increase. Layers above you don't add to gravity on you, and layers below just need to have a density and spacing high enough to let the previous layer's extra mass be diminished by your extra height from it, gravity falling off with distance and all. Weird notion, I'll admit, but I could see it. It reminds me of a scene from one of those novels I mentioned earlier, Book of the New Sun, The protagonist, Severian, refers to some folks as miners, and if you're paying attention you notice that they are actually grave robbers, and that's what mining means in that place set in the ruins of countless millennia of civilizations. 
And I say protagonist rather than hero because Severian's job as a roving torturer and executioner in a violent, decaying, hopeless civilization of that book series is a respected profession with its own guild, yet the author makes no effort to make him seem even vaguely heroic or nice. Like I said earlier, that's a common tone in dying Earth novels, one that seems rather justified too. The world is winding down and the sun is dying, you can't live on Earth forever because eventually the sun will burn out. However, we've talked about moving planets before, while the sun gets brighter every year, even as big as space is, that's so long that you'd only need to move the planet about a couple centimeters or an inch a day to avoid that brightening. Even at maximum red giant size, we could safely orbit out by Pluto. Nor is such a civilization really likely to be all that dependent on natural sunlight anyway. Solar shields could be erected to bounce light away, protecting us where we are right now all the way until the sun hits its maximum size, which may or may not be big enough to encompass our planet, we're not sure yet. But that's also fairly redundant to look at because it's very unlikely our sun will ever have a red giant phase if the solar system remains inhabited. That same star lifting technology lets you yank out the helium that is slowly poisoning the sun and decrease its mass so it shines more dimly and lives far longer. You don't have to move the Earth closer to stay warm, you could add meals as we've discussed for warming up places like Mars or Callisto, but in point of fact, an Echimonopolis planet benefits from reduced sunlight, and even if the top layer of such a mini-layered planet was left as natural forest, it would receive more than enough light for photosynthesis and be warmed by all that heat generated on lower levels, and you could still supplement that light if you needed or wanted. We will discuss dying stars in more detail in another episode, but in short, if you are really focused on keeping your sun around, keep to star sizes that are convective enough to swirl all the mass around so the heavier elements don't collect in the core where you can't lift them off. Then you can just keep replenishing your sun with hydrogen and removing the heavier elements produced, which are fairly valuable themselves, even helium. Stars a third the mass or less than our sun are fully convective, they bubble around like a stew, and live a lot longer as they burn all their fuel, most larger stars don't, and do it very slowly. Wolf 359, a M6 Red Dwarf 8 light years away from us, best known for where the Borg curb stomped the Federation fleet, has a bolometric luminosity of just 0.14% of the Sun, though that means it still gives off a million times more sunlight than Earth currently receives, some 540 billion trillion watts. To do this it has to convert almost a million tons of hydrogen into helium every second, or about 25 trillion tons a year. Sounds like a lot, but it would take it 75 trillion years to burn through an amount of hydrogen equal to the mass of our own sun. You could lift out everything besides hydrogen from the sun, constantly filtering it, and keep most of the hydrogen away too, in orbiting reservoirs to slowly filter back in. Indeed you could build artificial but classical spherical planets, shell worlds, around those and have a whole ring of Earth-like planets around your sun, something known as a Kepler or Rosette. And you could go smaller and live longer, or import hydrogen from elsewhere. There are hundreds of billions of stars in this galaxy, and most of the hydrogen in the galaxy is still floating around not in any star and on these kinds of timelines our neighboring galaxies will have merged into us to add their quantity too, so you've got plenty of sources. However, just our own sun's mass, spread out over 75 trillion years, pretty much takes you to the end of the stellar phase of the Universe. We haven't got too precise a timeline for when the last naturally forming stars will cease to exist, but we usually put it at about 100 trillion years. In the meantime, stars will have become smaller and a lot less common. Fewer large stars form and only smaller ones live very long anyway. M-type stars have a red hue and we call them red dwarves on a scale from M0 at the brightest to M9 at the dimmest. Wolf 359 is not a particularly small or long-lived red dwarf by the way, as it's an M6. Most stars are red dwarfs, M9 is the smallest normal star and those naturally live trillions of years, unlike our own sun's 10 billion. If they had the fuel mass of our sun, they'd stretch their lives out to about a quadrillion years, 
that is long after even late forming low mass stars gone to white dwarf will have cooled off to stellar husks. You could scale that up a trillion fold if you cannibalized all the spare hydrogen in the local group of galaxies for it. I don't think you'd do that, even if someone living outside our solar system didn't object. It would make more sense to do something else with all that, like build the maximum sized birch planet we discussed in Mega Earths. But if you did, that would buy you up to 10 to the 27th years, or a billion 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 years, well into the black hole farming era, as opposed to the roughly 1 billion left before rising solar output strips Earth's atmosphere away, if we did nothing about it. Of course we almost certainly would, I really doubt humanity will resemble much of what it is now at that point, your descendants a billion years from now are not likely to resemble you any more than we resemble our ultra great granddad who first thought having multiple cells was a fun idea a billion odd years ago. However, if there is a civilization around then, it seems very unlikely they'd not take steps to prevent such events, or that the galaxy would be particularly natural anymore. We can say stellar formation in the galaxy ought to drop off to very little in a trillion years and cease entirely in 100 trillion at most, you can have a lot of civilizations arise in a trillion years, but realistically, unless all civilizations terminate at about our current technological levels, rather than getting out to the stars, I wouldn't expect natural star formation to occur more than maybe a few million years after they left their planet. That's more than enough time to form a galaxy-spanning Kardashev III civilization, also known as a K3 civilization, where stars are only forming because you permit it. And you might not, preferring to use that fuel in artificial fusion plants rather than naturally occurring or artificial stars. But if you let stars form, they are probably doing so where and when you want, and at the mass you want, and with the metallicity you want. We wouldn't see a tribe sitting around a campfire and leap to the conclusion that their civilization will end in a few hours when the logs burn up, they are more than capable of finding more wood for their fire and storing it up. Likewise, discussing the natural lifetime of a K3 civilization in terms of the natural lifespan of the stars in their galaxy is equally absurd. So we could have Earth orbiting around our Sun, along with all sorts of other artificial planets and megastructures, for trillions or quadrillions of years to come, and frankly I think that's a lot more realistic than imagining folks living on Earth waiting for their atmosphere to evaporate away or the Sun to expand and kill us. I think that layered tomb world becomes a bit more realistic in that respect too. If you've got people who are more or less human after all that time, that means they are probably pretty obsessed with retaining their past, to the point of giving gene therapy to even the smallest mutation to prevent evolution, and they've probably gotten very good at preventing any sort of genetic or cultural drift. Off Earth, in the rest of the solar system, they might have gone this way too, if not one can assume a lot of the galaxy is totally alien. Heck, on these timelines, whole civilizations could have evolved from some marginally Earth-like planet no human ever lived on, someone just stopped by one day to plant a flag that happened to have some bacteria on it and things evolved from there to complex life. We'll imagine for now that everyone who favored a more post-human approach has long since left the area and leaves Earth be, a bunch of backward obsessed lunatics preserving history and all. Much of our solar system is similar in mindset and we've been extending the sun's life and shrunk it down. During that time, Earth's been building up layer after layer of museums and tombs by extracting building material from under the crust and filling those empty spots with hydrogen or deuterium to use for fusion fuel, layer after layer. After every last fuel reservoir orbiting the sun has been used up, it will start to die but won't go red giant. Rather, it will go straight white dwarf. Those are actually sufficiently bright when compared to red dwarfs, so we could go on as it cooled too. Indeed we could switch it over to running on helium now, plenty of that lying around at this point. But one day it will burn out and you just have Earth and its internal fuel supply left, with maybe some more they'd reserved in orbital reservoirs. They could easily have a planet's worth of hydrogen lying around and it takes about 300 kilograms to light up Earth every second and Earth of that mass would last 2 billion trillion seconds, or for 60 trillion more years. Actually not that long compared to the time Earth would already have been around for by then, 
but still 15,000 times longer than it's been around for us now, and 60,000 times as long as it would have left if humanity didn't intervene to save it from the brightening sun. You could keep going, cannibalizing the planet to be smaller and need less fuel, potentially no longer using fusion in favor of something like micro black holes, which are around a hundred times more fuel efficient and let you live a hundred times longer. That's when things do start hitting the dying Earth scenario, it just depends on how much fuel you had, and if they'd gone and hoarded a few suns worth for fuel for themselves, which is plausible enough, they might have 60 quintillion years via fusion, and 6,000 quintillion years via micro black hole. That is a very, very long time, a billion billion times longer than a human lifespan via fusion and a billion billion times longer than our whole recorded history by black hole or raw matter to energy conversion. And that's pretty much it for organic life. Odds are pretty good that's long gone by then anyway, in favor of digital minds. Still, I could imagine Earth being a place where organic life, and even somewhat classic, if probably fairly cyborged up, humans had remained the whole time. Is that the end of civilization? Quite probably not. And as we discuss in the Civilizations at the End of Time episode Black Hole Farming, a cooling and dark universe is just the beginning for civilization if it's running on computers, as civilization will be able to exist around black holes for epochs of time that regard even this extended timeline we discussed today as but an eye blink of time, and in Iron Stars we'll go far beyond that all the way to the real end of time when the only possible life is that which literally forms out of random chaos. For my part, I really can't imagine humanity in its current incarnation will be around even a million years, except for a few stubborn hordeouts, but civilization I suspect will continue till long after all the stars are gone, and I think there's a good chance Earth will survive not only our own sun, but all the rest of them too. Many of our ancestors thought the Earth was eternal, some thought it maybe only had a few centuries left at most, and while we now know Earth will die one day, we can see a way of pushing that far off toward as close to eternity as is imaginable. We always try to stay within the bounds of known science here at SFIA, even if many of the things we discuss seem beyond fantastic. I always like to stress that real science can offer us past the things that seem even more fantastic than the wildest dreaming of most sci-fi writers. We spend a lot of time discussing the sun's lifetime, and if you want to understand the science behind that, then I recommend that you check out Brilliant.org. Their astronomy course provides you with the physics tools that astrophysicists use to understand the cosmos, the life cycles of the stars, and the fate of the universe. Through active problem solving, you build up your frameworks to understand these concepts instead of just memorizing formulas from a textbook. You can dive right in at whatever your skill level is and explore at your own pace. I can never overemphasize how handy that math and science skill set is to have in your mental toolbox, and Brilliant is a great place to get started. To support the channel and learn more about Brilliant, go to Brilliant.org slash Isaac Arthur and sign up for free. And also, the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. That's the subscription I've been using to explore their multitude of thought-provoking puzzles. Next week, we will be pushing the boundaries of science a bit to look at teleportation and seeing what options might allow it, or something like it, inside known science. We'll also consider some novel applications of that technology that tend to get skipped in science fiction. For alerts when that and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.